Hello and welcome to Talks on Law. I'm Joel Cohen. Today we're joined remotely from here on the planet by Professor Franz van der Dunk of Nebraska College of Law. Professor, welcome to Talks on Law. Professor, maybe before we jump into some of the legal issues, this topic is becoming more and more practically important. Why don't you give us a little overview of current space exploration and use? Well, to go back into history, when, when the space era started in the late 50s and 60s, it was basically about two countries, the United States and the then Soviet Union, and it was basically about two things, military slash political and science. And those, uh, those summaries do no longer apply. Over time, we have seen an increasing amount of practical applications. Satellite communication, satellite remote sensing, satellite navigation are increasingly important for all sorts of human activities down on Earth. And that, of course, plays into the legal issues as well. Talking about satellites, I, you know, I saw a statistic in prepping for this conversation, the number of satellites in space over the last few years, it's, uh, it's, it's an exponential growth curve. Yes, and it's going to get even worse with uh, current plans of sending thousands of satellites into basically low Earth orbit in the next couple of years. And that is one of the major issues that the space lawyers of today have to grapple with in order to make sure that we don't create uh, a necessary mess up there with all due dangers for our own activities and for other activities in outer space as well. Another key change is that, you know, when we thought of the space race, it was a bit of a sprint, a two person sprint between Russia and the United States. Now there's a lot of other national actors. I'm thinking particularly of China, but also the European Union. Who else is actively pursuing Oh, spot on there. It's it's no longer limited to the United States and Russia and, and China. We've seen India uh, harboring serious plans of landing on the moon. Uh, we've had Israeli, Nigerian, Brazilian space activities. In Europe, everything is guided basically through the European Space Agency, but now the European Union has set its minds on a number of space systems as well. So we, we are living in a multipolar world also in outer space, and that of course raises a number of important legal issues as well. Well. And one one last overview, I guess, highlight is what's happening with private industry. This has been really exciting for some of the spectators out there like me watching uh, SpaceX launch these reusable rockets. And there's a number of other significant players in the private space. Well, of course, the baseline is that the private sector only gets interested if they see a possibility to make money, even if it's a little bit further in the future. And we may be, to some extent, lucky that we have some of these angel investors who are willing to spend billions that they earn somewhere else on Earth on taking still an enormous amount of risk out there. These private operators do bring also their own host of legal issues, as you can imagine, because precisely because they're only in it for the money, even if it's in the long run, um, there may be a tendency to, to neglect broader public interests, uh, whether we talk about science, whether you talk about security or safety, or even the environment nowadays. So it, it makes life for a space lawyer much more exciting than it used to be, but also much more complicated. Let's talk first about some of the resources in outer space. What are, what are businesses and countries most excited about or most nervous about currently? Probably two things. One is uh, water, which is an invaluable uh, piece of material out there, not just for living purposes, for astronauts of, of, uh, to, help, to give them something to drink or to grow their own food, but also to make rocket fuel. And the other thing is the, the, the general idea of using um, minerals which are already there, the so-called in situ resource utilization idea, that you don't bring everything you need to build a habitat on the moon from Earth, because that's incredibly expensive, but as much as possible, use local resources. So there is a, there's a big deal of interest there. Let's talk a little bit about our closest neighbor, the moon. First off, who owns it or who has a right to access it or exploit it? The, the easy answer is nobody owns it, uh, or more correctly, the 
the whole community of states owns it together. Because if you say that nobody owns it, it leaves open the possibility for someone to step in, but from now on, I own this part. And that is a no-go area. The Outer Space Treaty, uh, the most important treaty in outer space, uh, agreed upon in 1967 between all important spacefaring countries, agreed that no state could ever appropriate part of the moon. So if no one owns it and everyone owns it, Practically, what would that mean for a nation or a company that wanted to set up a base or a headquarters on the moon? Well, that's a great question. And, and at the face of it, it is open. Uh, now, let me premise this by saying that there, you have to make a difference between a private company and a state. The freedom of space activities, uh, like there is a freedom of activities on the high seas, is open for states in principle, in first instance only. And private sector operators depend upon the authorization of their state, whether they can enjoy that freedom as well. And if they do, the states are responsible and liable for what they do out there. So uh, in that sense, uh, there is a basic freedom for outer space activities. The problem with the exportation of mineral resources on the moon or other celestial bodies, which are legally speaking in the same basket, so obviously there are major differences between the moon and Mars or a small asteroid, but in legal terms, they're all the same. And if you want to exploit them, the only rule which is there is that it says you can't carve out a part of that area as a country and say, this is ours and everybody else has to stay out or only is allowed to get in under my permission. That is no go. But whether that means that you can actually allow private operators to go there and mine them, that is uh, at least politically still an open question because the Outer Space Treaty didn't really solve that simply because it was not on the agenda in 1967. You mentioned uh, the oceans as an analogy. I, I understand that when it comes to mining in the oceans, there, there is a treaty that allows certain countries to apply for and receive mineral rights. I, I understand the United States is not a part of it, but there's no such analogous agreement on the moon. Am I correct? You're absolutely correct. There was an effort to create an, uh, uh, a sort of analogous regime back in 1979 with the Moon Agreement, but that is not uh, ratified by, by almost all of the major spacefaring countries, not just the United States, but also Russia and China and all the major other ones are not party to that, so we can safely sort of ignore it at this stage. So there is no, no, no comparable regime. So it's a little confusing. Let's say I want to set up my headquarters on the moon and I, you know, I represent uh, Botswana. Uh, let's take all the practical implications out and all the costs out. Would that mean that the United States could then come onto my lunar compound and set up a building right in the center of it and say, look, you don't own this land. We all do. The first part, the answer is yes, they can come in. At least duly authorized representatives of the United States can come in to basically to check and see whether Botswana is not up to any violation of the requirements applicable to the moon in terms of no military establishments, no weapons and things like that. Uh, on the other hand, Botswana has the right to take reasonable precautions and say, okay, you have to, to, to give us a few weeks to make sure that everything is safe here. You can't just barge in like that. Again, practical things put aside. And the United States certainly cannot say, well, we're going to occupy your building. So the freedom of outer space activities means explicitly that you can build stations on the moon. You can even take reasonable precautions, as I said, before you have to allow others in. But you have to allow them in. And the fact that you're able to build a station on the moon does not mean that you own that part of the moon forever and ever. So if you at some point in time, do not continue operations there and you let it fall apart, then after probably just a few years, there is no consensus on this yet, but that's the kind of rules that we need to develop. But maybe after a few years, somebody else can come in and says, well, this is a ruin. This doesn't belong to anyone really anymore. Botswana has long given up on this. Now I'm entitled to build my own thing here. Is this some type of lunar uh, squatter's rights or adverse possession? 
Yes, with the limitation that uh, when we use those terms in US law, of course, we, it brings in a whole host of quite specific obligations and rights because in US we've been known, uh, we've been working with these terms for, for centuries almost, and the courts have by now very precisely carved out what they mean and what they not mean, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, we can't just transplant US law and US jurisprudence on the moon precisely because the moon is not part of the United States. So the best we can say is that to the extent that there is a common denominator between this US system and other major legal systems in the world, many of which have something somewhat similar to the extent that there is this common denominator, that would apply. And actually, that is reflected, if you will, by these clauses in the Outer Space Treaty, which say, well, you can't own the land, but you're free to use it. Um, the fact that you can't own it means that at some point in time, you can't keep others off. You can't keep everyone out forever. Now, whether that means that you can continue to use that place forever and thereby de facto, uh, in fact, can keep everyone out is still an open question. And, and if you allow me to, to, to draw a kind of a parallel, um, in terms of satellite communications, we have now agreed that 25 years of occupying one particular orbital slot in the geostationary orbit is about right, is about, uh, you know, allowable. But once that period is over, in principle, that slot should revert to the open pool. And it might be that others are entitled to replace that slot. So that's kind of the timelines that we are thinking about. What about in terms of uh, some type of buffer zone? I know that, you know, if you, again, back to the ocean, there are U.S. territorial waters that go out a certain number of, of miles. Would there be some type of buffer zone around your little space station that would be you know, reasonable for safety reasons or reasonable for, for privacy reasons or, some, or the like? Yeah, reasonable is a dangerous legal term, of course, and it, it is not mentioned in the Outer Space Treaty. It just talks about reasonable precautionary measures. So there you find actually the word reasonable referenced. Um, the idea of a zone as such is not mentioned, partly because of the fear that that might uh, ultimately somehow spill over into territorial possession, uh, because it may give a sense of, well, that means that I own whatever is in the zone, that I can completely dictate what's going on there, that I treat that as part of my own territory, and that was to be prevented. On the other hand, uh, if you announce a safety zone, and it is a reasonable precaution, so it shouldn't be 20 miles, but if it's like 150 meters, that's reasonable. And if you tell everyone, you know, if you come within that zone without prior uh, information without announcing that you're coming into that and without our agreeing on to how you come into that because it may endanger our operations, then we feel ourselves entitled to see this as, a, as an enemy activity or as a dangerous activity and we feel entitled to act accordingly. That's kind of the political uh, situation where we are in there. This is not legally sought out. So, what legally becomes important is the moment that somebody officially announces a safety zone like that, how do other states react? Do they think, yeah, it's, it's perfectly reasonable to announce a safety zone of half a mile, just to quote a number, and, and actually we are going to do that ourselves. And then before you know it, you have customary international law that a safety zone of half a mile is very reasonable. If by contrast, everyone would fall over that first state and say, oh, that's ridiculous, that's a violation of the, of the, of the Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty and of other rules, then probably the first state must gradually withdraw its idea unless it really wants to fight for it, uh, which we're not hoping for in outer space, obviously. But that's kind of the legal tension we are talking about. And Professor, I love that you mentioned this concept of customary international law. For those who maybe don't remember uh, from law school or didn't, didn't attend law school, uh, customary international law is sort of an alternative means of coming to uh, an accord. Rather than some type of treaty, it just means that in practice, the vast majority of the nations have implemented it. Is that about right? Or have, have at least given it off as their official opinion that that's the right way to go and, and, and behave themselves accordingly. So if all states, uh, without a treaty saying you can have a safety zone of half a mile, start implementing 
their own zones of half a mile and respect those of others, which is, of course, the flip side of the thing, then you can say, well, they, they act under the assumption that this is now a legal obligation and that's customary international law. That's, by the way, what happened with the law of the sea before it then got enshrined in the treaties. This gives a little bit of hope that there can be a, some practical minded approach that the laws are, are being, in a sense, tested on the ground as space exploration expands. Uh, absolutely. And I mean, that's what we see happening, for example, in another area, uh, one of the most important areas of space, uh, the most largest concerns of space and therefore also of space law, which is space debris or space junk, right? So there is no legal obligation in the Outer Space Treaty because back then it wasn't an issue. Nobody thought about the environment and, and you know, this one or two third stage rockets that were floating around, who cares? You know, that was the thinking in 1960s. Now, of course, we are in a totally different situation, but article, uh, the articles of the Outer Space Treaty do not even provide for an obligation not to wantonly spoil outer space. Uh, the, the, the Indians may have raised a big stink when early 2019 they destroyed their own satellite, creating a huge chunk of space to be. But legally speaking, there was no rule prohibiting them from doing that. And there is also no rule to clean up your own mess after yourself. Eh? If you have a satellite out there, which is, uh, which is at the end of its lifetime, um, there's no international obligation requiring you to make sure that it is boosted into deep space, never to be seen again. It's not like hiking on a, in a national park where you're expected to pack in everything that you, you want to use and pack it all out, bring out every little uh, sandwich wrapper that you brought with you. On the other hand, coming back to the customary law issue, what you do see happening is that states have already agreed on guidelines that that's not the proper way of behavior. Guidelines are not, not legally binding. So it's still a recommendation for states, which could be seen as customary law uh, as, or sort of as a starting point for customary law. What we also see happening is that the guidelines, which in themselves are not legally binding, are now used by various states, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, as binding obligations in terms of the licensing regime for their private operators. So one of the guidelines is you shall make plans for an afterlife disposal of your space object, which is, again, not a legal obligation, internationally speaking, but a recommendation. But you see now that if in the US you want to have a license for a launch or for a space operation, the regulatory agency is going to require you, well, what is your plan for afterlife disposal? And if the plan that you show to them doesn't satisfy their concerns, you don't get a license. So at the private national level, it starts to become already a binding legal obligation, which going back to customary international law at some point in time may lead to the conclusion that apparently the United States considers it now a matter of law that you can't just leave your satellite up there. You have to do something about it at the end of lifetime. And if you have more countries along the same lines, then you get customary international law. So that's a process I think, I hope, which we're in the middle of right now. So while there's no current law, say for example, banning pollution on the moon or, or littering on the moon, uh, perhaps we're well under the way of creating one through customary international law. Absolutely. And an interesting thing is if you look at this most, most uh, novel feature of the Artemis Agreements and the Artemis Accords. Uh, Artemis is, of course, the NASA program planning to land the first woman on the moon uh, and the next man. And they want to do that with international cooperation. They have already agreed with four other countries to cooperate. And in the principles under which the Artemis Accords should be operated, the idea is we should not pollute the moon. So again, NASA cannot dictate the Italian or the Japanese space agency how they behave because there is no international rule, as you rightly point out, as of yet. But if NASA starts to behave like that in the context of the Artemis Accords and if its partner starts to operate like that, again, this can form the nucleus for five or ten years down the road saying, well, hey, now we have a customary international law obligation. You cannot pollute the moon anymore. So, so this is, again, a, a very interesting example of that process going on as we speak. And uh, are, are any of these uh, nation states consulting their, their local space lawyers to, to get some, some insights onto how to more beautifully or more elegantly preserve this, this customary law? 
Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I hope it is the case in, in a number of countries where I can't really see that happening. But as part of the University of Nebraska program, we are constantly involved in discussions with the regulatory authorities and the agencies and the Hill uh, and, the, and the private operators on, on how to move this thing forward. So yes, certainly in the US context, uh, there is a major role for us space lawyers uh, to be involved. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the moon. Now, just like here on Earth, all lunar acres are not created equally, some aspects of the moon or some areas of the moon are considered much more valuable. Right. And, and that can be either from a scientific perspective, uh, what, what we call the dark side of the moon, which is, of course, really the far side of the moon, is very interesting for science because at that point, part of the moon because it's unseen from the earth. You have no interference with whatsoever, uh, either in terms of light or radio waves or anything else coming from the moon. So if you want to do deep planetary research from the far side of the moon, you're in an absolute paradise of silence and you can you, the only things you see or hear are coming from deep space. Uh, if you look at the commercial interests, obviously they are interested in places where there might be water, where there might be minerals, places where in terms of the light and, and, and darkness or the, the heat and cold conditions, it's easier to operate. Uh, the, 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 the temperatures between night and day on the moon can differ from, I don't know, plus 150 to minus 150. It's an enormous range, which means that uh, your equipment, if you want to do something there, has to be able to work both in an extreme heat environment and in an extreme cold environment. And if you can find places where somehow, because you're in a crater or because you're in, in, in all the time in sunlight or all the time in, in, in outside of the sunlight, can, can uh, sort of eliminate at least parts of those enormous fluctuations, those might be interesting as well. So yes, there's a lot of variation in the value of the moon. I'm just thinking you mentioned the incredible value of the dark side of the moon for scientific research because you're undisturbed. Well, you might soon find yourself disturbed by one of these other states who's setting up their, their listening portal or their listening station, um, which might perhaps interfere. True. Well, there are also rules about interference. If you talk about radio interference, the International Telecommunication Union has a whole system for trying to, to provide that security against interference. It goes too far, far into detail to, to, to discuss here right now. But if you go through all the hoops that the ITU requires, then at the end of the day, every space operator has a set of frequencies which he is entitled to use basically without being interfered with by anyone else. So if interference happens, there is an ITU system for trying to solve that. And you have a legal right, which if necessary, you can defend in an international court or an international arbitral tribunal. The other side of interference, when it comes to physical interference, is something more difficult and the Outer Space Treaty only provides for a ge very general principle, namely that you have to consult if that happens, which doesn't necessarily deliver a solution, as you can imagine. You mentioned ice on the moon and there is at least ice found on the poles, or maybe it's more concentrated on the poles. Does this give a sort of first mover advantage to the early explorers like the United States or, or perhaps uh, Europe or India uh, to get to these more valuable areas first and set up their stations in advance of other explorers. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, at the same time, this sounds maybe a little bit frightening, uh, first comer takes all. I think in reality it's not going to be that dangerous because if you think practically speaking, we are not able to build space stations yet which cover hundreds of square meters or even larger. So it may well be that let's say the Chinese are first there and that they build a station there, but then going back to our discussion on safety zones, they can't then simply say 20 miles around this station is everybody has to keep out because this is a Chinese keep out zone. That is certainly not reasonable. Um, and, and since we presume that those fields are of a considerable size, it would certainly allow the next one being the US and the next one after that being the Russians and the next one after that being the Europeans to set an, up another station, maybe a mile away or a mile and a half away, still able to tap into the same water resource. Uh, I'm not a scientist. This has to be validated by scientists, but that's what I would expect to happen. So 
if you keep your strict eye on the limitation of these zones to what is necessary for safety, as opposed to what it might be desirable for grabbing it all and keeping it all to yourself, then I think uh, there's a fair chance that you won't have uh, the first comer takes all, but it still leaves the point, of course, that countries like Botswana, which you mentioned earlier, uh, may be too late in the game uh, or may be only left with, uh, with the crumbs off the table. And, and there might be at some point in time we might need to think about that. I'll just take the devil's advocate position for a moment. Uh, when I think, you know, with my entrepreneurial cap, you know, what makes for a successful business, sometimes people describe a moat, some type of barrier to entry. It's hard to think of a more uh, daunting moat than you know, thousands of miles of, of empty space and billions of dollars of startup costs. Absolutely. Well, but, but that works two ways. It works, it works, it, it namely also works in the direction that if you are interested in spending those billions because you see a chance to make a profit at the end of the day, which of course is what private enterprise is all about, you also want to make darn sure that whatever you harvest there, you can sell to everyone around the world. So it is in the private operator's interest and therefore also its own country that there is no fundamental opposition in the rest of the world as to seeing this as kind of stealing or illegal squatting or whatever term you want to give it. Um, which means that there is a balance between the interests of the first comer in being given free reign as possible and the need also for that first operator to be recognized as a bona fide operator, as a legitimate operator, as recognizing broader public interest in space. Uh, because if it does not, he may be the first to get there and he may all harvest all that he wants, but as soon as he moves to outside of his state, he will be treated as if he's selling blood diamonds and be forced to give it all up, right? So there's an interesting, if you allow me a minute or two to explain, we talked about the, the maritime solution and the United States not being part of this uh, international regime for the harvesting of resources from the ocean floor. Well, there was a number of years ago, a very interesting case where Lockheed Martin, as you obviously know, one of the largest US corporations was very interested in mining the deep seabed floor. Now, they could have gone the easy route. They could have said, well, we are a US company. The United States is not party to that international regime, so we don't have to go through all these hoops. We just go for a US deep seabed mining license. And since the US authorities are very friendly to us, we will only be faced with the minimum of requirements and burdens, and we're good to go. But they realized that the rest of the world being tied in to the regime of the Law of the Sea Convention would likely consider whatever they would take from the ocean floor, again, as blood diamonds. They wanted to make sure their market was as big as possible. They established a daughter entity in the United Kingdom, which was party to that uh, agreement. And that daughter entity went through the extra hoops to get a license because now they could show to the rest of the world, this is very legitimate, right? <laughs> and that same kind of balance I think private operators in outer space have to keep in mind as well, because if you spend that much money, you can't afford to cut off 60% of your potential market. Let's talk about uh, mining. And you, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about the land or where you can set up your station. Are we pretty clear? Are we, are we all on the same page that what you take off the moon can be owned by an individual state and then perhaps owned by individual companies? Uh, pretty sure is a little bit too far, I'm afraid to say. The United States started the discussion five years ago when they formally recognized these rights of private operators under a U.S. license to, to mine those resources and to take them home. Since then, we've seen that the Luxembourg and the United Arab Emirates have uh, agreed upon similar laws and, uh, you know, not accidentally, I was part of the teams advising them to do so. Maybe I'll jump in for our audience who may have detected a subtle accent. The Netherlands is your original home. That's absolutely right. Uh, my country was a little bit more hesitant, but meanwhile, there are a group of European countries which are discussing with Luxembourg how to make sure that all this happens in the context of uh, duly extended 
rules protecting the environment, protecting safety and protecting security, which of course in itself also includes a principled recognition that it should be allowed under certain, under certain rules. You see the Chinese engaging in those discussions as well. And you see that NASA, through its Artemis Accords, also tries to promote this general idea. So if, if other countries want to cooperate with NASA and will, to a certain extent, piggyback on NASA's activities for doing these lunar exploration activities, manned lunar exploration activities, they have to sign up to the principle that, indeed, private operators, if appropriately licensed, can go there and harvest those resources. So I do see a gradual trend in the right direction, what I consider the right direction, but we are not there yet because there's still a number of countries, Russia first of all, who politically speaking oppose that. I'm not sure how long that opposition is gonna last, but it's still there. And meanwhile, I read that Russia did auction off some of its own lunar rocks for, uh, to private citizens who were willing to buy it. And to go even one step further, when it comes to the Russians, they announced Venus was a Russian pl planet, which to me reads that they claim Venus, not just the, any natural resources thereof, which is already pretty de debatable to claim resources ahead of actually going there. Uh, there is a difference between going there, getting them out, and then saying them, this is mine, or saying they are mine, and I'm going to go there in two years from now. But they actually claim the whole planet. So I fairly think that the Russians cannot complain about a well-guided, uh, well well-regulated uh, private sector operation on the moon harvesting those resources. And barring some uh, unforeseen, currently unforeseen Russian expansion here on Earth, it would be hard to imagine that simply claiming it, I've got dibs on Venus, will withhold uh, legal mustard. Exactly. And as you mentioned earlier, according to the Outer Space Treaty, the rules on Venus would ostensibly be the same as those on the moon, which is that all the nations own it and thus no individual nation can claim it. Absolutely. The Outer Space Treaty just speaks about celestial bodies and it includes the moon, which is, of course, a sui generis uh, body completely on its own. It's the, own, the only companion that the Earth has, but it also includes planets. Uh, it includes asteroids, meteoroids and, and things like that. Every, every hard rock floating in outer space is, is, is covered by that provision. Why don't we talk for a second about national laws governing outer space. And since I'm uh, here in the United States, what does the U.S. have to say? What are the U.S. laws on outer space? Well, the baseline for national space laws is the obligation under the Outer Space Treaty to authorize and supervise. That is, the, those are the literal words of Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty of any non-governmental entities, which is, of course, mainly private enterprise. So before the United States could legally allow private citizens or companies to, to do anything in outer space, they need to set up a licensing system, a system for authorization and monitoring their activities. And the US has diligently done that. They have a Commercial Space Launch Act, which requires every US launch service provider to get a license before he can do that. And of course, before he gets the license, he has to come up with a no number of, of uh, pieces of evidence that he's safe, that he knows what he's doing, that he's got enough insurance, etc., etc. If you want to operate a satellite as a U.S. company, you need a license from the Federal Communications Commission. If you oper want to operate a remote sensing satellite, you need a license from the Department of Commerce. Um, when new private activities come on board, such as space mining, for example, you now have a discussion going on in the U.S. context, which would be the appropriate agency to regulate that, to license those activities. But that's basically where space, national space law comes in. And while you're at it, uh, while you're as a country taking care of your international obligations to authorize and supervise, you can also use the laws to promote as far as you want private sector participation. And obviously the United States as, as a free market country is in principle very much in favor of private enterprise and, and, and uh, entrepreneurial activity. And obviously you can use the national law to promote that in many ways. Who's actually giving the, the approval or the licenses to companies like Blue Origin, SpaceX, Boeing and the like, who are trying to 
do transport into outer space? The transport licenses are the the the, re, the the remit of the Federal Aviation Authority, which has a an office for commercial space transportation, and of course that's all within the Department of Transportation, and they give the licenses for any launch and also reentry in in applicable cases of spacecraft. As you mentioned, the United States is a little more free market. We have encouraged or allowed private industry to do these launches. If a country like Russia or China, for example, wanted to keep it all within the government, for example, they could. They could. And actually, the Soviet Union has, of course, until uh, uh, when they were still communist uh, back in the days, they have done so. They, they, in their political perspective, uh, private ownership of economic production factors was, was a no-go area because of their political philosophy. So there was no private enterprise of note, and certainly not in the space arena, which also meant that there was no need for a national space law in the Soviet Union or Russia as long as it was communist. And that applies to China up to this day, while in Russia, after the Soviet Union fell apart and Russia then turned, at least to some extent, into a free market economy, uh, you then saw that in 1993, the Russians also created their national space legislation to allow private sector space activities under their authorization. Could you envision a future where there was, let's say, a Panama of, uh, of space flags where a specific country might be the most commercially friendly in order to get more of the, of the business, in a sense? Of course, you're speaking about the, the, the risk of flags of convenience, a cheap licensing state, uh, going for the lowest licensing, which is a problem in the maritime sector. Uh, you can never exclude it in space, but I think there are two good reasons why I think in space this is not likely, certainly not in the near future to happen. One is the fact that if you license a launch, uh, if you allow a operator to launch from your territory, you are allowing him to conduct the most, most dangerous part of his activity on your territory or just above it. Uh, if you, again, if you make the comparison to the law of the sea of Panama, license a ship and doesn't impose any safety regulations because it is not really interested and it just wants the small fee for its, uh, for its register uh, and, and, and ship owners flock to Panama because they can get a very cheap license there. If something bad happens to the tanker, the chances are 95% that the victims are somewhere else, that that happens on the oceans or in front of the American shores, of African shores, etc., etc. Contrast that with space. If something bad happens for a launch because you allowed a floppy operator, you know, without any safety controls to launch, 95% of the chance the debris is raining on your head. So that makes a state presumably much more wary to hand out licenses just for the sake of attracting activities. So perhaps the imminence of the danger or the extremity of it could be a path out of this tragedy of the commons economic challenge. Yeah, in particular because it, the extreme danger backfires on the state who is the launching state, right? The state where the launch takes place. That's the practical reason, and then in addition there's a legal reason, and that's also different from the law of the sea, that goes back to the Outer Space Treaty and another convention elaborating that, which says that the state is liable also for damage caused by private actors. So if the United States allows SpaceX or Boeing to launch under floppy circumstances and the, the thing lands in Mexico and crashes and causes a billion dollars of damage there, the Mexican government is entitled to request the one billion dollar damage, not from Boeing or, or SpaceX, from the US government. That's the international regime. So again, the US government, knowing that, better make sure that they only allow Boeing or SpaceX or whoever you want to care to, to put into there to fly if they are very certain that A, they know what they're doing so that the chance that they will crash in Mexico is minimal and B, even if they crash in Mexico, that they have the appropriate insurance to cover at least a major part of that liability. So again, there's a, the, the, the way space law is structured presents a strong urge on states on not giving away cheap licenses because you are going to have to pay the bill at the end of the day. Fascinating. Has that tragedy happened yet? Have we seen a state have to go uh, pay another state because of a, a down satellite or, or some other orbital disaster? So far, no. Um, there have been a few 
uh, satellite on satellite hits in outer space, but they were, uh, with one exception, they were all satellites or, or uh, other debris of the same state, which then, of course, becomes a matter of that state to regulate. International law doesn't dictate how France should solve an internal conflict if a French satellite hits another French satellite, right? Or, or take the US case, same thing. The one exception is when a Russian satellite, which had run out of control for 10 years, crashed into an Iridium satellite, Iridium being a US operator, which was thereby kicked out of operation. Uh, but for a number of reasons, which probably goes a little bit too deep right now, both sides choose not to make a legal issue out of this. So we have never seen a formal claim in that sense being laid on the table. When it comes to the mining, the US view is that nations and companies under them can or perhaps will be able to extract minerals. Is there an alternative view? Yes, there is. If, if, you, if you put it very simply, Article 2 says only that the area cannot be appropriated, is, is a race communis, if you will, a global commons. Uh, and then you can interpret that in two ways. You can interpret that the US way, which says, well, a global commons means that it's, it's open for everyone to benefit from it, meaning that we can uh, exploit it ourselves or allow our private sector to exploit it. And the alternative meaning is that you say, well, because it belongs to everyone else, all the minerals in there also belong to everyone together, to all the states together. So you can't have one single state determining, well, I like this operator, I give him a license and he make him make a lot of money. That's the kind of interpretation that the Russians try to put up there. I think that it is, legally speaking, the weaker interpretation um, because there is very little sound legal argument other than the overarching uh, interpretation question. Um, but that having said that, as long as the Russians and maybe a few other states are still of that opinion, it still is a political discussion because, you know, a law professor can say that somebody's totally wrong, that a state is totally wrong, that may not keep that state from upholding its wrongful position, right? So we talked about how states are responsible for their national activities. Why don't we talk a little bit about the liability of the commercial actors in the space? First, let's do a quick overview of this new, I think, super cool industry called space tourism. Well, space tourism is so far subdivided in two. We have seen already in 2001 the first space tourists uh, spending a week on board of the International Space Station, that is orbital tourism. Dennis Tito, who paid something like $20 million for the privilege. A couple of people have followed him since then, and that is what we call suborbital space tourism. Those are basically orbital, suborbital flights. I com call them sophisticated bungee jumping, because you do it for the kick of five minutes of weightlessness, the beautiful view of the Earth from outside, etc. But the flight doesn't last for longer than maybe a couple of hours, and you don't go higher than just at the low into the lower boundaries of outer space, let's say 105 or 110 kilometers. And in this space, some of the, the players are what, Virgin Galactic? Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin are the first two to being successful there. What are some of the liabilities and challenges for those operators, legal challenges. The, the, the interesting thing about suborbital manned spaceflight is that it raises for the first time a second type of liability, namely the liability of the operator versus the passenger. Um, the liability towards third parties on the ground was already a long-standing issue, has already been long solved, and there are, there are very um, well thought out and detailed processes to determine that. What is new here is if something bad happens and you're on one of these flights, do you get compensated for your damage for your, or maybe for do your hairs get compensated for your death? If you or I fly on an airplane and something bad happens to us, the airlines are forced to pay huge sums of money to compensate us for our loss. Or if we die for, for the loss of our descendants, our heirs. Meanwhile, if I go skydiving, I have to watch a long video and sign away every right I've ever had to, uh, to negligence, gross negligence, uh, and beyond. Right. And for the time being, that regime is applied by the U.S. Congress to manned spaceflight as well. U.S. Congress has given the operators the right to fly passengers 
uh, without accepting any liability as long for the passengers, not about third party liability, but for the passengers, as long as these passengers have each signed a informed consent document whereby they recognize that they are flying on something which is not certified for safety by the US authorities. In other words, it's an unsafe thing. And if you do that, you take your own risk and don't come whining if something goes wrong. The only thing that ad that Congress added to that is a timeline that that sort of exemption in principle only applies to 2025. So at that time, Congress reserves the right to reassess whether uh, the, the industry may be so mature that they can afford to take away this special protection for the operators or whether it's still necessary for further development to extend that grace period. So that's for the suborbital. Let's talk about the long term, I suppose we could call it long term uh, tourism in space. Are there different legal liabilities there? That depends actually on who you are flying with. That's why suborbital is so new. Suborbital for the first time use privately funded, privately operated vehicles. I spoke of Dennis Tito before, he still flew on a Russian Soyuz and the others did too. So they were just private passengers on a, on a public transport system, which meant that the liability was for the Russians to take care of and how they handled that vis-a-vis -vis Dennis Tito or the other tourists was their own issue. When it comes to a private operator, if SpaceX starts flying tourists to outer space itself, then the same rule may still apply. It so far has not been applied to, uh, to, to orbital flights because there are no tourists at this moment for orbital flights. The reason why SpaceX and Blue Origin and Boeing are developing them is that NASA needs a replacement for the space shuttle, which used to be a public vehicle, but of course has been retired. And now, since the United States does not want to be dependent upon the Russians to fly them and their astronauts to the space station, that's why NASA has given a big boost to these private operators. But they are still flying NASA astronauts for the time being, which means that it's a different ball game. And NASA has already arranged for a separate status of their government astronauts by way of law as well. So currently, the liability issue for orbital tourism hasn't been delineated from what we've discussed so far because there's really no near-term plans for it. If SpaceX uses the technology help developed with the help of NASA for getting astronauts to the space station for saying, well, now that we have the technology, we can also fly a couple of millionaires for a couple of orbits around the Earth. I presume for those types of flights, they will apply the same liability that we just discussed if the timeline is not extended or whatever. But if it concerns flights to the space station where you have professional astronauts doing it, I'm assuming that there will be a slightly different regime, but that hasn't been developed yet. Let's talk about rescue. If you're on one of these orbital tourism flights and your ship needs to be saved, and let's say another country has to come and get you at, at great expense, who's on the hook for that? That's a great question. Um, and there are some rules in international space law which deal with that. But these rules were developed back in the 60s and 70s when the only people in outer space were government astronauts and cosmonauts. Cosmonauts just being the Russian version, the Russian term for astronauts, right? So they were all public employees. They were doing that. Uh, they were risking their lives for the sake of humankind, for the sake of science. And that's why these treaties give them a kind of a special uh, status, a special deference, which includes the obligations for every state to do whatever it can within its power to rescue them if something went wrong. Now, fast forward to the first space tourists and the discussion arose, should we really accord those people who after all do it for the fun and just because they have an incredible amount of money to afford it, should we accord them the same kind of deference uh, as an astronaut who is risking his life for mankind and not for his own pure private pleasure. And the general consensus, I dare say, is probably not, right? Um, which means that states 
they always have a general humanitarian obligation to do what is reasonable to rescue a human in distress. That applies on the ground or in the mountains or on the seas, etc., etc. But you don't have to go out of your way. Now, what the difference is between reasonable and out of your way, uh, there is obviously a difference between it. But where the borderline is, nobody knows for sure. Um, so far, it's all been theoretical anyway. But I would assume... Uh, that when you talk about a space tourist in distress, the assumption would be, well, he took that risk knowingly and willingly. Huh? Think about the informed consent. So why should a state put up many millions for a rescue operation? On the other hand, if you have a mountaineer going up Mount Everest, he is also taking a huge risk. And there is still a sort of public obligation on the part of the Nepali government to try and rescue him the best they can. But they don't have to risk their own lives to do that. So maybe that's where the borderline is. But this is still something to be sought out. It's certainly much more complicated when we're talking about multi-billion dollar spaceships with extreme costs and, and I imagine higher risks involved as well. Absolutely. And, and, and you should also think about the reality. Eh? If, uh, a rescue in Everest, Everest, you can stage within a few hours or maybe a day. A rescue in outer space, you don't have something ready to launch on the launch pad. Uh, it may take at least a few months, unless you are lucky that there is something on the launch pad or something in the neighborhood which can easily maneuver. So that's something else to factor in this whole discussion, that it's not likely that you can just, okay, there we go, right? You've done a great job explaining some of the rights of nations on celestial bodies, but at the end of the day, part of the issue is going to be how they enforce those rights. Let's talk a little bit about military's ability to, to step in and set up a base, for example, on one of these celestial bodies. Yes, well, I won't touch upon the point of enforcement for the time being because that's a whole different uh, ball game. But the Outer Space Treaty is pretty clear that there are to be no military bases, stations, maneuvers, or anything like that, let alone weapons, on the moon or any other celestial body. So that's a very strict regime to which, again, I should say, uh, United States, Russia, China, and all the other major space nations have agreed. So uh, if they do something like that nevertheless, they are in violation of that agreement. So the, the regime limiting the military use of the moon and other celestial body is really very limited. You are allowed to use military personnel as long as it's for exploration purposes. And of course, you couldn't expect otherwise because all the first generation US astronauts and Russian cosmonauts were after all military personnel, or almost all of them were. When it comes to outer space as such, however, the regime is much less strict. It only prohibits the stationing or orbiting of weapons of mass destruction, read nuclear weapons. So the use of space for military reconnaissance, uh, for military communications, uh, for navigation of, of terrestrial uh, cruise missiles, etc., etc., as such is not prohibited by the Outer Space Treaty. Interesting. So if, if the United States wanted to set up a new uh, space station, a domestic space station, if you will, a new U.S. space station that was for military purposes and they wanted to stock it with explosive rockets, they'd be welcome to do so. They couldn't build a similar station on the moon. Exactly. When it comes to the moon or to celestial bodies, what do we do with that? If there's no ability to set up a military station, and there are certain rights that will eventually need to be enforced, will, will nation states be able to set up local police forces, for example? I consider that very unlikely. Um, the, the, the setup of the Outer Space Treaty uh, presumes that every state is sovereign, uh, so there are only limited, uh, l limited limitations to that sovereignty. I mentioned one earlier, the obligation to allow uh, representatives of other states in your space station is was precisely uh, included in the Outer Space Treaty for that reason, so that if the Russians would have a, a base on the moon, the United States representatives, again subject to reasonable precautions, would be entitled to visit that base just to make sure that the Russians would not harbor any weapons or other military plans there. In terms of enforcement, 
there is nothing in the Outer Space Treaty, precisely because it's a treaty between sovereign nations, and neither the United States nor presumably every other na- any other nation would give the United Nations or any other international body the right to police that. So it's all a matter of bilateral controls. What about if the United States wanted to, you know, you could imagine a world where if there's a number of commercial actors on the moon and there might be some disputes among them, perhaps we would want the United States to have maybe a national enforcement unit stationed there as well. As long as it's not military, um, then that would be, be okay. But then we, we should also realize that the, uh, the, the, the power, the competence of such an agency to deal with disputes would only extend in as far as it only concerns U.S. citizens or U.S. stations. So if there are two U.S. private companies having having a fight or in a, are in a dispute over a certain place on the moon, then it's up to the U.S. to solve this dispute between those two private operators. But if one of them is Chinese, you know, uh, the Chinese will never accept that uh, a U.S. entity would decide on a dispute between a Chinese operator and a U.S. operator, and vice versa, the U.S. will never accept a Chinese to decide on that, right? And that's where there is no international overarching regime to make sure that that happens. So that all has to be done by, by bilateral negotiations between the countries. And the only thing that the treaties say about this is this limited provision Uh, requiring everyone who has a station on the moon or another celestial body to allow access to a duly authorized representative of another member state to allow that member state to make sure that that other state or that other operator is not doing anything in violation of the treaties, read maybe harbor weapons or do anything else military which is not allowed. Again, are, are you allowed to bring any explicit weapons onto the moon? What about even a pistol? Now, of course, we should not re- we should not forget that the pistol probably doesn't work on the moon, not the way pistols are built right now. It is not literally spoken. Uh, the, the word weapon. I, sh- I should maybe qualify that the word weapon as such is not in this provision. It talks about military activities, uh, military stations, military bases. So weapons which are exclusive to the military are by definition prohibited. So if you talk about tanks or big guns or, 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 or fighter jets, which won't work on the moon either, but just you know, as a way of imagining, uh, that is prohibited. A simple pistol, is that a weapon in a military sense? I doubt it. But again, I'm not sure that it makes sense to bring a pistol in the first place. Because it may or may not work. Exactly. And what about as an American, if I'm on a a base in, on the moon, do I have my Second Amendment right to bear arms? The right to bring any arms to the, to the moon is limited by what the Outer Space Treaty says. So if the arm is something that is used for military purposes, like a tank or a gun or a, or, or a machine gun or things like that, uh, the answer is no. And not even the US national laws can change that. Uh, whether you t- when you talk about a pistol or something like that, which is not subject to this limitation of military arms, military munitions, then it becomes a different matter. Now, the, the, the NRA or, or any U.S. law can only extend to U.S. settlements, not outside, and can only extend to U.S. citizens. So whatever Chinese is entitled or not entitled to carry around is not for the NRA or the U.S. authorities to decide. I appreciate you humoring my joke with a reasoned out response. I'm a lawyer, right? No military establishments on the moon. I have to bring it up. What would that mean for a future space force base on the moon? That's a great question. And I'm going to give you a lawyer's answer. It depends, right? If, if you look at the Space Force, the way it's presented so far, it can mean a range of things. What is currently happening is, is essentially a, a fundamental bureaucratic re- reorganization. So far, the U.S. Air Force has taken care of all the U.S. military operations and interests in outer space. And that's now simply set aside. So we now have a separate heading, which means that it's a shifting of personnel, of money, of buildings, of authorities, etc., etc. But there's not much happening there. Now, in addition, what could happen and what I assume is part of the assumption by many 
dealing with the Space Force is that it also means that the budgets will go up. Because the argument would be, well, Russia and China are beefing up their space operations and we need to be on a par, not to, not to be left behind. There it becomes a matter of a political assessment. If you, and I don't know the answer to that, I, I'm not privy to all the military secrets, but if you have evidence that the Russians and the Chinese are already gearing up their military space forces, and they do already have their own space forces for a number of years, uh, then it's only fair to, uh, to accept that the United States can do the same. They're just sort of going with the flow, making sure that they don't fall behind. If you are on the contrary of the opinion that the Russians and the Chinese do not do anything of the sort, and that the extra financing in the US context would be to gain the upper hand more than it may have now, then there may be political concerns, political, not legal, but there may be political concerns that thereby you are pushing the Russians and the Chinese on their turn to beef up so that the escalation is uh, is caused by the US action as opposed to the Russians or the Chinese. But that's again a matter of political interpretation and nobody in international law can limit the access uh, or, the, or, the, or the amount of money that a particular state pours into outer space. There may be political concerns about raising international tensions uh, that, may be a go, uh, that may go against the general spirit of the space treaty, but not the latter. Where it really becomes legally tricky is if the space force would include, and that goes back to your original question, if the space force would include actual bases on the moon, right? Space troopers running around with their machine, their laser guns and firing to any, any foreigner in sight. Now that's a clear no-go area under the under law, under international law, as the US uh, uh, agreed upon it. Also, if it means that the space force would result in being nukes, nuclear weapons being orbited around the Earth, that's also legally speaking a no-go area. So it all depends on what is a, a, effect uh, at the end of the day meant with Space Force before I can give a solid legal assessment. I'm curious, uh, before we let you go, when you watch one of these uh, sci-fi shows like The Expanse, or, or even going back in time, Star Trek, are you, all, are you thinking about them as a space lawyer thinking, oh, hmm, I wonder how, how this legal regime actually compares to what we have in place? No, not really. I'm enjoying it for what, they, for what it is. Although having said that, I have learned enough. I've been in touch with enough scientists and astronauts to know a little bit about that as well. And I recall that 10 years ago or something like that, I was sitting with my boys and watching one of those movies about fighting incoming asteroids, right? And, and my boys said after 15 minutes, Dad, can you please leave the room because you're spoiling all the fun? Because I was saying, oh, this is not the way it happened. This is, not, this is totally wrong and it, it doesn't look like that at all and stuff like that. But no, the legal issues usually do not come uh, prominently in those, in those movies. Professor Vanderdonk, thank you for your time today. My pleasure. <laughs>